Uh, welcome everyone to the Institute for Applied Ecology's uh, 2021 Krebs Lecture. I wanna, my name's Richard Duncan. Uh, I'm the director of the Centre for Conservation, Ecology and Genomics, which along with the Centre for Applied Water Science forms the Institute for Applied Ecology here at the University of Canberra. And on behalf of the Centre and Institute, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this lecture. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people, the traditional custodians of the lands on which the University of Canberra is situated, uh, to acknowledge and respect their continuing culture, their contributions to the life of Canberra and the region, uh, their deep understanding and appreciation of the natural world, and I'd like to acknowledge all First Nations people who are with us today. All right. Tonight, the Institute's very pleased to host the 11th edition of the Krebs Lecture. Um, the lecture was initiated as a forum for sparking debate among scientists, managers, policymakers, and the public on topics related to environmental science. The lecture series named after Professor Charlie Krebs, who's a thinker in residence in the Institute for Applied Ecology. Uh, and it recognises Charlie's substantial contributions to our understanding of the natural world. Now, in normal times, Charlie and his partner Alice would be joining us here. Uh, but of course, with uh, the travel restrictions this year's pandemic, they haven't been able to come over from their native Canada. Uh, and actually, because of the later date as well that the, um, the lecture's been scheduled for, uh, Charlie and Alice are actually up in the Yukon trapping snowshoe hares at the moment. So they're also unable to join us virtually. But Charlie has recorded a brief message and we'll play that at the end of the lecture after Kathy's spoken. All right, it's now my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Kathy Bellow from the University of Sydney. Um, I think one of the most significant uh, advances in biology over the last several decades has been our ability to obtain ever increasingly detailed information about the genetic makeup of individuals and populations. And Cathy's research has been at the forefront of efforts to use this genetic information to assist in conservation management and the recovery of threatened species, uh, particularly uh, species that are impacted by disease. Cathy's received numerous awards for her research and leadership, including two Eureka Awards, the Crozier Medal from the Genetic Society of Australasia, and the Fenner Medal from the Australian Academy of Science. She was made a Fellow of the Royal Society of New South Wales in 2018 uh, and an Officer of the Order of Australia in 2019. Cathy currently leads the Australasian Wildlife Genomics Group at the University of Sydney uh, and is also the Pro Vice-Chancellor for Global Engagement. Her research group combines fundamental work aimed at understanding the evolution of gene families and genomes with the application of that understanding to solving pressing uh, conservation problems. Uh, Cathy's research epitomises uh, the ideal of science as a means of both understanding the natural world to and using that understanding to make a real difference in conservation management. And so it's with, with great pleasure that I would like to invite Professor Cathy Belov to present tonight's Krebs Lecture. Thank you, Richard. That was a really lovely introduction. Thank you. Um, and I also would like to acknowledge um, the Nullawal people um, uh, on, you know, on whose land we're meeting today, and particularly acknowledge um, any Indigenous people that we may have in the audience. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's my first um, talk post-COVID and my first interaction with so many people. We're still not... Um, quite as engaged in Sydney as you are in Canberra, so it's really lovely to be here. And I apologise in advance as I adjust to having real people in the room. <laughs> so thank you for having me. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing, understanding immune genes in marsupials and applying that to recovery of species in the wild. And it's actually... Um, you know, it's been a tough year for us all, hasn't it, with COVID and with the pandemic. But one of the positives to emerge out of all of this is everyone knows what a variant is now. Everyone knows what a genetic variant is. And in fact, I think we all wake up in the morning tracking what's the latest variant out there? What's come out of quarantine? Does that variant make people sicker? Or 
do the vaccines work against the latest variant? So that actually makes my job a lot easier because just like viruses have variants, so too does our immune system. And there's a lot of variation in our immune genes. And that variation is really important as well. Because when you think about COVID, why do some people have no symptoms at all? Why do some people just get cold and flu symptoms? And why do 15% of people end up in hospital or worse? Because they enter what are called these cytokine storms where their immune system becomes overactive. Some of that's age or comorbidities, but a lot, an underlying facet of that is the variation that occurs within our genes. And that's what I study. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about molecules of the immune system. So in this picture here, pointer work, you'll be able to see here we've got a virus infected cell. And on the surface of the cell, there are these little markers these are MHC molecules, and it's their role to present fragments of that virus to the immune system. And then our immune system knows to come in and kill the infected cell. And the interactions that occur um, between the MHC molecule and the T cell receptors are quite complex. And of course, variation in immune response doesn't only affect the severity of the disease symptoms that we face. Um, it also affects the way that our body responds to vaccines. And in fact, I was just looking at the stats, something like yellow fever, there's a tenfold difference in the strength of immune response of a person to the vaccine. And again, that comes back to variations in our immune genes. So the immune system's beautifully complex. There are lots of cells and lots of molecules involved. And one of the exciting things about these molecules is they're super variable. There's lots of difference in these molecules between each of us, which is why we can all mount very different immune responses. So my background studying genetics of immune response in marsupials and monotremes. And I, as I was preparing to give this talk, one of your marketing people said to me, but, you know, why? Why did you start thinking about this? And it's actually interesting. Um, I was working at the time in a lab that was focused on doing marsupial conservation work, and my supervisor at the time was having a conversation with a colleague of his, Janine knows this fellow, and he made the comment that marsupials have a primitive immune system. And I just remember thinking, but that's crazy. They've been around for tens of millions of years. On the whole, they're healthy. Why would they have a primitive immune system? It might be different to our own, but it's not going to be primitive. So Des Cooper, my supervisor, said, well, go ahead and prove him wrong. And that's where it started for me. Uh, you know, I was in a position where I could start characterizing the immune genes in marsupials and monotremes to be able to show how different or similar they were to our own genes. And when I started during my PhD days, we needed to go in and clone each gene one at a time. So you would amplify the gene. That was not as easy as it sounded at the time. You would clone it, you would amplify it, and you would sequence it. And my PhD project involved cloning seven um, brush-tailed possum immune genes, which at the time was massive. Um, but of course, things have come a long way now with the advent of sequencing technologies. So from about the mid-2000s, we started working on these whole genome sequencing projects. Just like the human genome was sequenced, we're now sequencing genomes of many of our native animals. And that was fantastic because you get this genome, and then you can bioinformatically mine it to annotate the immune genes and identify the immune genes that way. And so to cut a very long story short, what we've found is on the whole, marsupials and monotremes have pretty much all the same genes that we do. They just look a bit different because we've been evolving separately for 130 million years. But there are some interesting innovations in marsupials. And the reason these innovations have occurred is because of the way that marsupials and monotremes give birth. Um, marsupials give birth to an underdeveloped young, 
um, that goes on to develop in a pouch, whereas monotremes lay an egg. But when that egg hatches, the puggle itself is also tiny and underdeveloped. So both the joey and the puggle don't have any immune tissues or organs when they're born, and their immune system develops entirely outside of the mother's uterus. So it's a really interesting model to study because the mother is providing a lot of immunity to the young, but the young are also developing their immune system in a system where you can watch it um, change over time. So when a wallaby is born, I mentioned, no immune tissues, no organs. It climbs up to the mother's teat and attaches to the teat. Interestingly, um, many of my, some of my reproductive biology colleagues were doing operations on these joeys because they were accessible. And these joeys would never develop infections at the sites of those incisions. So for a long time now, we've known that there's something in the pouch that's protecting the joey, but we didn't know what it was. When we got the genomes, we were able to identify these expansions of gene families of genes that are actually antimicrobial peptides. These peptides um, fall into a couple of categories. One of them is the cathelicidins. And to give you an example, we have one in humans. Um, in the koala, there are 10. And in each marsupial lineage, there's also, you know, a dozen, you know, 14. So we see these expansions. These peptides are produced in the mother's milk. They're produced in the lining of her pouch, but they're also expressed on the skin of the joey itself. And we know that these peptides change the pouch microbiome. So the pouch can go from being quite dirty when it's empty to being quite sterile and clean when the mother has a joey in it. And what we've been doing is synthesizing these peptides and testing them against a range of bacteria and fungi. And they're amazingly potent. And each peptide will kill a different range of bacteria or fungi. But some of them will kill, for instance, golden staph, which is a, a, a really horrible multi-drug resistant bacteria. So we really do think that future antibiotics could be coming out of the pouches of marsupials. And we've got a large grant now through an ARC Centre of Excellence in Innovations in Peptide and Protein Science, where we're mining Australian wildlife for these novel peptides with the aim of developing them and ultimately commercialising them as novel antibiotics. So what I want to do today is talk about two case studies of how we use this fundamental immune gene information for conserving species in the wild. And I'm going to talk about two species that we've worked on for quite a bit, the Tasmanian devil and the koala. So the Tasmanian devil is um, now our world's largest remaining marsupial carnivore. It got that title after we lost the thylacine back in the 1930s. Many people aren't aware that devils were common on the mainland of Australia. They went extinct, we think, about 3,000 years ago due to competition with dingoes. They've always been found in, in Tasmania. They got isolated. The devils in Tasmania got isolated during the last ice age. Um, so there hasn't been any movement between Tasmania and the mainland since then. And we know that there have been some really big population crashes in Tasmania where the numbers have dropped really low and then built up again. And we know when that happens, what happens is you also lose genetic diversity. The species go, goes through what's called a genetic bottleneck. And the species is now listed as endangered. Um, I'm just checking. I've got to warn you, the next slide's a bit gory. So if you don't like gory pictures, maybe look away. But this is an example of a devil with devil facial tumor disease. So it's a really unusual disease because it's a contagious cancer that's spread by biting. And devils jaw wrestle, and they tend to bite over food and when they're mating. And that's why the primary tumors tend to occur around the face or the jaw. But they can develop primary tumors elsewhere. 
And these tumours grow to the point where the animals starve. They're not able to feed themselves. The tumours can also metastasize and cause organ failure and other, and other challenges. So the disease was first seen in the northeast of Tasmania, up here in the Mount William region back in 1996 by a wildlife photographer who observed devils with tumours. Unfortunately, at the time, nothing was done. And by the time it was taken seriously, the disease had spread throughout Tasmania. So now the disease pretty much covers all of Tasmania, apart from this pocket up here in the northeast and also down here in the southwest. It's had a, a dramatic impact on populations, where local populations have declined by about 95%. Overall, we've lost about 85% of devils. But what's interesting is that all of the initial predictions were predicting that the species would be extinct by now, but it isn't. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So I mentioned this is a clonal cancer, a, an infectious cancer. Now, normally you can't catch cancer. But in this case, the reason we know it's a transmissible cancer is because of work Anne-Marie Pierce and Kate Swift did looking at devil chromosomes. So you can see here um, the devil chromosomes. So, so there are six of these what we call autosomes and a pair of sex chromosomes. And down here you can see the chromosomes of um, a single tumour. And what I'm hoping you'll be able to see by the beautiful colour coding that Janine actually did was chromosome one broke up and shattered and you've got parts of chromosome one here and in the marker chromosomes. Um, you've got a vastly rearranged carrier type. The sex chromosomes are gone, um, and you've just got little fragments of sex chromosome in these marker chromosomes. Now, such chromosomal change in a cancer isn't unusual. Most cancers undergo chromosomal change. What's unusual is that in every tumour that was looked at, the rearrangement was identical to this one. So that simply couldn't happen independently in every animal. Instead, we think this event happened once, um, and then that cancer spread from animal to animal. And actually, the molecular genetic work shows that that tumour arose in a female devil, because there are two copies of the X chromosome genes, and it was a Schwann cell. It was one of her nerve cells, based on the pattern of genes expressed in the tumour. And that tumour moved from animal to animal, passing through, we think, about 100,000 animals, killing them along the way. So this is where I got excited because I read that paper and I thought, this doesn't make sense. How can you have a foreign cell passing from one animal to another without invoking an immune response? If we were to take my kidney and put it into you, your immune system would reject it because it would see it as foreign. The same thing should happen with devils. So this comes back to the MHC, which I mentioned before. So this is a key region of the genome that contains immune genes that are involved in um, immune response against infectious diseases, parasites, autoimmunity, but also graft rejection or tissue transplantation. So if you need a kidney, you're most likely to go to close family members and you would be genotyped at these MHC genes to try to find an individual who shares the same MHC genes as you to minimise the chance of rejection. So these MHC molecules are found on all cells. We saw a picture of this before. So this is your bit of virus, and the MHC molecule is presenting the virus to the T cell. And the way the MHC works, it takes up a big chunk of the genome, 4 million base pairs of the genome, um, and you've got hundreds of genes, all in one stream, usually. And what's interesting is not only do you have lots of genes, but there's variation between individuals in their genes, and also between species in their genes. And you can see on that tree there that different species have quite different MHC genes, which evolved through a birth and death model of evolution. So it's a fascinating um, gene family to study. So the first thing we did was we thought, well, maybe devils have low MHC diversity. 
because they've been through these big population crashes. And we know they have low genetic diversity overall. So we did, we looked at MHC, we characterized the MHC in devils, which was a bit of a process, and then we looked at diversity between different individuals. And we found that that MHC diversity was critically low. And we thought, well, of course, the tumor cell comes from a devil as well. So it has an MHC. So perhaps because there's such little MHC diversity between the tumor and the devil, that's why the disease is spreading so effectively. So we had to test that. Um, and to test that, we needed to do some skin grafts. But it was actually quite hard to find people who could do skin grafts on devils. We did end up finding a plastic surgeon in Hobart, Grant Kimball, who was prepared to do it. But here are some photos of devils getting some skin grafts. And what you can see here is this bit here is an autograft. So that's essentially this bit of tissue just moved over here to check that there's no problem with the surgery, with the process. And here we've got an allograft. So this is a piece of skin from another individual. So for our theory to hold up, we would expect that both of these bits of skin would heal over um, and it would show that there was a lack of MHC variation between devils. And we got to 14 days and we got really excited. We thought, yes, we've proven it. It's looking good. Um, but in science, you can never celebrate early because just a couple of days later, and we started to see the rejection. So the rejection occurred later than it normally would, but it did occur. And you can see that rejection around the allograft there. These are just punches that Alex took to do some pathology work. And by three weeks post-surgery, it was clear that the rejection <coughs> did happen. And so I mentioned Alex did some pathology. So up here, you've got the autograft, the devil's own tissue. You don't see too many brown dots. The brown dots are lymphocytes or immune cells. Whereas if you look at the allograft, the foreign skin, there's lots of lymphocytes rushing in. So that shows the immune system did see that the skin was foreign and did go in and reject it. So then Hannah Siddle, who's a, who was a PhD student in my lab, went on and kept looking at the MHC. And what Hannah found was that in the tumor cells, some of the genes involved in the MHC expression are switched off. And that means that the tumor doesn't actually have any of those MHC molecules on its cell surface. So that's why the devil's immune system doesn't see it, because there's just no MHC being expressed on the surface of the tumors. And what was great was that Hannah went on to show that this wasn't a structural thing, it was an epigenetic thing, and she was able to reverse it in culture by adding interferon gamma to cell cultures. She could switch the MHC back on in tumor cells, and that's actually what we use for the basis of our vaccine in devils. So these um, tumor cells have MHC on the cell surface. Devils see that MHC as foreign, and they mount an immune response against it. What was frightening, though, was back in 2014 now, a second tumor was detected, DFT2. And so this wasn't a clone of the other tumors that I was talking about. This was a completely new tumor. And it had arisen actually in a male. Um, and it looked quite different genetically. Um, what was interesting was we caught it earlier in the evolutionary process. So this tumor still expressed MHC on the surface. And so therefore, it was only spreading between devils that were quite similar to it genetically at the MHC. But there was already evidence of immunoediting occurring in devils where some of those MHC molecules were being switched off on the cell surface. And so that's really interesting because it brings us to contagious cancers. I mentioned they're not common. There's a common one in dogs, canine transmissible venereal tumor. It's a sexually transmitted disease. It's a cancer that evolved over three, well, it's over 3,000 years ago now, and it's been passing through dogs. It's mainly now found in feral dogs and wild dogs, but we do have it in Australia. Interestingly, the disease evolved in a very similar way. It started in populations of inbred wolves that had low MHC diversity. 
And then the tumor evolved these immune evasion strategies by downregulating cell surface MHC. What's interesting was that this dog disease, though, got to the point where it became the ultimate parasite because it would switch off its MHC genes while it was being transmitted. And then the dog would get infected, and during that time, it would transmit the disease to other dogs. But usually within about six months, the tumor would then switch its MHC back on, and the dog would recover. Whereas our devil disease isn't that smart at this stage, and it's killing all the devils. So we don't know whether it'll get to that stage, but it does seem to be a bit of a, 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 bit of a similar trajectory that the two cancers have been through. And just because we could, we decided to look and see when devils lost that MHC diversity. So this is Kat Morris in my lab and Jeremy Austin from the University of Adelaide. And Jeremy went caving and found old um, devil bones, including bones from the mainland. Um, and we went through museum specimens and looked at mainland devils, which were about 3,000 years old, and amplified MHC genes from them. And what's interesting is we found not much more genetic variation. We found a few new variants, but not many. So it shows that MHC diversity in devils has been low for a long time. So what we wanted to do was, it, it was sort of an interesting thing to be going through because we were doing this interesting work on the cancer and on the immunology of the devils in the lab, but we wanted to do something useful to help devils now. And, um, you know, one of the challenges was we were watching these populations plummet before our eyes. So back in 2006, we got involved with the captive breeding program. So this is one of Australia's largest captive breeding programs, where over 200 animals were brought into captivity as founders and bred um, to preserve the genetic diversity of the species away from the disease. And that program's been fantastically successful. You've probably all seen devils at your local zoo. They're managed through a stud book. We provide the genetics on those animals and make breeding recommendations based on the genetics of those animals. The dots on the map represent where our founders came from. And what you'll find is that the eastern and the western devils are genetically quite different. And you can see this on this plot. So the western devils are pink and the eastern devils are blue. And that's been known for a long time that there's this structuring in the population. But we started thinking, well, what would happen if you crossed those eastern and western devils? And so we were able to do that experiment out on Mariah Island. Um, this is an island off the east coast of Tasmania. And over a period of time, together with our partners in the Save the Tasmanian Devil program, we released um, about 35 animals onto the island. And they bred really well. They did really well. So there was 97% survival. There was only one animal that didn't make it. Um, and that poor animal was squashed by a wombat at the bottom of a wombat burrow. So <laughs> there wasn't much we could do. <laughs> but the devils bred and, you know, they, you know the, the, their genes spread through the population to the point where we're actually actively contracepting animals on the island and moving animals off the island because, of course, you don't want too many carnivores on an island. But what I wanted to show you is what happened to the genetics. So remember, our western animals are pink, our eastern animals are the darker blue, and when we look at Mariah Island, there's lots of genetic diversity. There's lots more diversity than there was in either of the previous populations. So that was really exciting. And one of my PhD students, Rowena, actually went in and looked at the MHC in those hybrid animals and was able to show that MHC diversity was higher, but also what was exciting was parasite loads were lower in these crossed animals than in those um, that were not hybridized. Of course, there's no disease on Mariah Island. So the next step for us was to think, well, could we apply this approach, which is what we call genetic rescue, um, to wild populations where there is disease in those populations? So again, together with the Save the Tasmanian Devil program and San Diego Zoo, um, with the support of an ARP linkage grant, we identified half a dozen 
populations that had low genetic diversity, where we wanted to introduce devils to see what would happen. And today I'll just tell you a little bit about stony head. And stony head's found just up here. So stony head was a population that had very low numbers of animals. You can see here, um, back in um, 2014, there were about 10 animals left. Um, but the prevalence of disease was really high. It was sitting at 30%. So we were at the point where we were thinking, this population is going to crash, or it has crashed. We're going to lose this population. So in 2016, we released 33 devils into the area. And we actually released the Mariah Island devils that I was showing you before with lots of genetic diversity. So straight away, you can see that the number of animals shot up. And you would expect that. We put more animals into the population. We were pleased to see that the prevalence of virus, a, a virus of tumor, didn't shoot up. That was good. But we wanted to see whether there was any genetic rescue. And over here, you can see this, these are our Mariah Island devils in blue with lots of diversity, our stony head animals without much diversity. And when we crossed them, <coughs> we got both Mariah Island, Mariah Island crosses, which are these animals here, and we got stony head, stony head crosses. But we also got all these hybrids in the lighter blue. So these were stony head animals that had bred with Mariah Island animals. So that was really exciting for us. So at the moment, we're still digging through the data because we've got a lot of information about those animals. We've got information about their parasite loads, their weight, their you know, reproductive status, and all of that. So we'll have more news about the impact that it's had on the devils soon. So I mentioned at the beginning that um, Initial estimates suggested that the devil should have gone extinct by now. And that hasn't happened. And you've probably seen a lot of talk, um, particularly in the media lately, about have devils become resistant to the disease. Um, that would be a lecture in itself, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. But I will say there's some evidence that there are some genetic variants in the population that may provide some resistance. The number of those individuals is small. It's around 12. Um, so I would be very careful to say devils are resistant. I don't think we're ready to you know, go down that track. But I think it, it, there is some promising news there that some animals are able to recover. We also know that the tumor is evolving and changing. But we don't have a good understanding about how the tumor is evolving. So I can come back and talk about both of those things another day. What I wanted to say was we've been focused on the immune system of devils. And what we found really interesting is that the immune system of devils starts to senesce or atrophy quite early. So devils, well, first of all, I'll say, when, it, when the disease comes into a population, it affects older animals first. So devils tend to live for about five years in the wild. When the disease arrives in a population, it kills the five-year-olds and the four-year-olds first, and then it kills the three-year-olds. And sometimes you've got the two-year-olds with the tumor, but they're hanging on and breeding. So we started thinking, well, maybe there's something about changes in the immune system in devils that influences that. And one one from my team was able to show that in the second year of life, when devils hit puberty, their thymus atrophies. So that's quite early atrophy of a thymus. And the thymus, of course, is where their T cells develop. So this thymus atrophy is accompanied by all sorts of other immune system changes, like a decrease in lymphocytes and a switch from cellular to humoral immune responses. So we think that's a large part of why adults are more susceptible to the cancer than the subadults. And this is just some graphs to show you how antibody levels decline with age, how T cell receptor diversity declines with age. And what's interesting here is we looked at T cell receptor diversity in healthy versus wild devils. And there's something else going on there. So it's not just aging. We were able to show that 
DFTD is somehow able to suppress the immune response in devils um, and suppress their ability to mount T cell responses. So it's a really clever cancer. It's not only hiding from the immune system by downregulating MHC, it's also suppressing the immune response. So now we're going to move on to koalas. So again, with koalas, we sequenced the genome. I had the pleasure of co-leading the koala genome project with Rebecca Johnson, who many of you know. And as part of that project, my team really focused on understanding the immune genes in koalas. And the reason we were interested in immune genes in koalas is because of the critical issue um, that is facing koalas at the moment with chlamydia and chlamydial disease. But again, these MHC genes came in handy. We were able to show an association between MHC genes and mate choice in koalas in a captive population. So we can actually help zoos improve their breeding success by matchmaking devils based on their MHC genes. With chlamydia, chlamydia is really tricky in koalas. I was thinking about that on the plane today. In many ways, it's similar to COVID because many koalas have chlamydia. Most of them are asymptomatic. But the severity of the disease is really quite striking in some animals. So you can have anything from mild conjunctivitis in some animals through to complete blindness, a bit of cystitis through to infertility. And we're really interested in understanding what it is that causes that overactivation of the immune system, which causes most of the damage that happens in severe chlamydia. So the genome allowed us to dig into that a bit more. So this is Paris, who submitted her PhD last week. Um, Paris looked at koalas that had responded to the chlamydia vaccine that Peter Timms developed in different ways. So some animals just didn't mount an immune response to the vaccine at all. Others mounted a strong immune response. And she found association with three genes. Notice two of them are our favorite MHC genes. So this information can help us um, both improve the vaccine with time, but also to know which animals are likely to respond to the vaccine based on their underlying genetics. We're now doing this same project with animals that cleared chlamydia and those that didn't. Um, so I'll be able to tell you about that next time. Just trying to check the time. So one of the things we also did was look at what were the immune responses going on in a koala with ocular chlamydia. And to do that, we swabbed the eyes of infected and uninfected animals and looked at the level of expression of genes and compared them between the healthy and the chlamydia-affected eyes. And this is Dennis O'Mealy, who I know some of you know as well, who did this work. And Dennis found that there were 1,500 genes upregulated in the chlamydia-affected eye. Most of those genes were involved in the immune response. So now we can look at that. Interestingly, um, you know, we, we know that a certain level of interferon gamma clears chlamydia too much, causes scarring of the eye. We're also working on koala milk, which is one of my favorite projects at the moment. Um, because it, many of you may know that hand-raising koala joeys is really difficult, and many of them die of infections during development. So we wanted to understand how koala milk changes over time. And to do that, we looked at the genes that were expressed in the mammary gland. We looked at the proteins in the mother's milk, and we aligned them to the genome. And we found over 680 genes, immune genes, in the milk. Um, and what we're doing now, together with the koala hospital, is working towards developing an artificial milk. At the moment, they're using a bovine type of milk. We want to start adding these immune factors, which change during the course of lactation, to help improve koala survival of these orphans. We're also doing a really exciting project with both the state and the federal governments on koala management. So 
we've got support to sequence 20 koala genomes from every, well, we haven't got all the funding, but we've got most of the funding to sequence 20 koala genomes from every population across Australia. And the reason that we want to do that is we want to understand the functional genetic diversity that's out there before we lose it. Because in reality, we're going to have to start actively managing koala populations going forward. And so, of course, I'm particularly interested in immunity and chlamydia resistance, but we can also look at environment, climate change, um, heat tolerance, um, and also reproduction and changes in timing of reproduction. And we can use this information to help guide future translocation and captive breeding programs. And I know I'm out of time, so I'm just going to very quickly say the IUCN lists 15,500 species on their um, critically endangered list. Only 0.8% of them have a genome, which is frightening. Australia has 8,000 vertebrates, 24,000 plants. Um, most of them are endemic to Australia and are not found anywhere else in the world. And of course, our populations are going through terrible times now through um, habitat destruction, development, and also the recent bushfires. So we've set up the Threatened Species Initiative I know Arthur and Craig are here. They've set up Ozarg, Janine with um, Oz Mammals. We've got a lot of genomics initiatives going on now in Australia to characterize the genomes of our species and apply that information to species management going forward. So I just want to say a big thank you to my team. Um, you can see largely women, but I've worked out that's because the boys don't show up on the days we take the photos. Um, <laughs> And also all our many, many collaborators and stakeholders without whom we couldn't do this work. So thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions if you have any.